My name is Michael Claudius. I am joined today by Michael Moyer, Head Archivist at the Clara Thomas Archive and Special Collections at York University Libraries, Gilberto Fernandez, Co-Founder and Project Manager of the Portuguese Canadian History Project, and Christopher Grafos, Co-Founder and Project Manager of the Greek Canadian History Project. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about this thing called an archive? Often when I mention the word archives, uh, especially to uh, undergraduates. Words like dust and mold come to mind, um, <laughs> and decrepit old keepers of the record. Uh, I tend to have a somewhat uh, broader <laughs> vision of what archives constitute. Our role really is to preserve documentary heritage in a wide variety of media. It's not just paper, also photographs, maps, documentary art, music, choreography, um, electronic records, MP3 files, TIFF files, JPEG files, websites, databases. The spectrum of information that's being created now is increasingly being reflected within archival holdings. So the role of the archivist in the first place is to select which documents will be preserved, which documents have enduring value. Do I need to keep council checks? Probably not. Do I need to keep all the notes I have from lunchtime appointments? Those could take a miss too. But things like diaries and correspondence, photographs of family functions, programs from community events become a record of a community's history, a record of its evolution over time. And so that material becomes preserved in an environment that's secure, um, protected not only against uh, intruders, but also against the environment and, if at all possible, natural disaster. And in that environment, the documents are described so that they can be made discoverable, so that they can be found by people who might benefit from them, and then they can be used, to, in the case of York University, to support research and teaching. But I was also very firmly committed to the fact that when I worked at the City of Toronto, that it was the historical record that allowed the citizenry to be informed of the historical context of contemporary issues. So that when people try to understand why their communities work the way that they do, the nature of relationships between, say, the Copts and the Portuguese and the Greeks and the rest of the diverse population in Toronto, then you can look back over the archival material whether it be in, in newspapers or letters or council proceedings or what have you, and really understand where these issues have come from and can make informed decisions about the future. And can also can, can celebrate the human experience. Why should people donate to an archive? There's a wide variety of reasons. Um, and I'm seeing a significant demographic change going on right now. Um, I refer to these factors as the four horsemen of the baby boom. Things like retirement, so people are getting older, they're leaving their, their workplace, they can no longer hold on to their papers, and so they have to find, they have to make a decision about what they do with the legacy of their careers. Secondly, we have people who are downsizing, they're moving from 2,500, 3,000 square foot homes into 900 square foot condominiums. And they're being told by their partners, no, you can't take along all those files. No, you can't take all those books. Um, thirdly, we have people who are facing financial planning decisions, especially those who have made investments in registered retirement savings plans. And when you turn 70, they have to be cashed in. And if you've managed to avoid the Canada Revenue Agency the first time through when you got paid, they'll come looking for you when you're 70. So, one of the benefits of making a gift to a public archives is a tax receipt that can continue to help to shelter some of that income. And lastly, increasing numbers of our population are dying or are suffering from dementia. And so children, nieces, nephews are looking at their archival record as a way to ensure that a person's legacy is not forgotten. And long after people may have forgotten what they've done during their daily lives, we can turn back to the archives and that personal legacy endures and can be shared. 
and can help to inform the next generation. Once the material is donated, once somebody has made that choice, what happens to it? The people who work in archives, <clears throat> the archivists, the technicians, the conservators, um, there's a tremendous sense of respect for the record that they've inherited from people. There's a tremendous sense of stewardship, of responsibility to ensure that records are looked after properly, that they're preserved. And so we'll store paper-based records in acid-free file folders, acid-free boxes. We'll put them in a, an environment where temperature and relative humidity are controlled to promote the long-term preservation, inhibit the growth of mold, ensure that they're not susceptible uh, to sources of water damage and what have you. For dealing with photographs, we could be looking at cool or cold storage, the same with sound and moving image recordings as well. Um, if films or videotapes have been stored in basements that have been very humid, then they need to be moved to an environment where the temperature may only be 7 degrees Celsius. The relative humidity may only be 25%. That slows down the deterioration of the formats so that the information is accessible as, for as long as possible. But in some cases, we then also have to look at the conversion of those records into a digital format, whether it's uh, sound and moving image recordings, or whether it's paper-based material or photographs. Initially, we can look at digitization as a preservation mechanism, whereby people no longer have to use the original artifact. But more and more, we're realizing that digitization opens up other avenues for discovery by putting them up on the web and allowing the records to be shared with a very diverse community. Also allowing people to communicate or to contribute to uh, our knowledge about those artifacts, people who might recognize individuals they see in photographs or in films. Are there any restrictions that would be imposed on access to such material? Yes, sometimes. It depends. <laughs> Can I make this answer any more ambivalent? Um, <clears throat> it really varies from case to case. As with access and privacy legislation in Ontario and in Canada as a whole, the emphasis is always upon access that is, that is as open as possible. But situations arise. Sometimes there will be case files if we're dealing with the records of a social service agency. And let's say somebody applied to, say, a settlement house for relief, for support. Would they necessarily want to share that information with other people while they're still alive? So there's a sensitivity that third parties, individuals who worked with organizations or prominent members of the community whose records have gone to the archives, they might not have ever intended to share information with people who might have shared it with a larger community of readers. Instead, there was an expectation of confidentiality. So the archivist inherits that, that responsibility of maintaining the privacy of individuals. And so we will put in place access restrictions based upon provincial legislation, even though the legislation does not govern private records, will still carry forward the spirit of the legislation so that records are closed for the life of individuals plus another 30 years. But we also can take advantage of provincial regulations that have set up a model for a research agreement so that people can still make use of that material so that we can develop a better understanding of, of a community um, and yet anonymize the names of people so that they're not identified in the final research. And also making sure that any notes that are taken remain secure and in the possession of the researcher. Why is it important for individuals to preserve their personal and institutional records in an archive? Where to begin? <laughs> well, perhaps if, if that's okay, I can, I can start by uh, coloring in uh, what uh, Michael has just said with one example, the example of the Percy's Canadian History Project. Uh, we found that there's, there wasn't a whole lot of um, materials, um, archival materials, in the public archives when we did our research. The stuff that was available at, say, uh, Archives of Ontario or City Archives or, or uh, Library and Archives Canada, for instance, uh, tended to be, the vast majority, 
uh, records produced or amassed by uh, government record keepers. So they certainly have um, a skewed, they have one important perspective, but it tends to be a top-down perspective of a specific community. And mind you, this is at the time of uh, multiculturalism as a policy and as an ideology and as a, a system of, of uh, political uh, networking uh, was becoming dominant. Uh, that type of ide that ideology tended to um, see ethnic communities as largely homogenous groups, where they were represented uh, in many cases by self-appointed leaders. Uh, who end up, ended up representing specific interests in these communities which were otherwise heterogeneous and quite diverse with multiple solidarities and uh, quite a lot of tension, uh, which is the case for, certainly was the case for the Portuguese, it was certainly the case for the Greeks, and certainly the case pretty much for every community. We wanted to get to the, uh, the sort of stuff that social historians look at, which is sort of the... Uh, uh, they look at the history of so-called uh, common people, uh, which nonetheless do extraordinary things, but the, the anonymous masses say. So certainly immigrants fall into that category, workers or women or, or large groups of people, and as opposed to the great individuals, uh, the fathers of the confederation, great uh, you know, war generals, that sort of uh, more traditional history. So in order for us to get to those stories, we literally went knocking door to door, uh, maybe not so literally. In some cases, he was <laughs> literally, um, and did oral history. In those interviews, we um, discovered essentially that the people who were interviewing the politicians, journalists, uh, health workers, basically people who uh, participated were active agents in the history of the community that I was studying, uh, but they were also in positions that allowed them to have. Um, a sort of a larger view of that community uh, and take the interest to uh, keep those records uh, understand the legacy of it. When I was in third year at the University of Toronto, I was taking an immigration to Canada class and the professor gave us the opportunity to write a paper on any ethnic group or any theme related to the course that we could choose. And Inevitably, because my parents are from Greece, I decided that I was going to write this uh, defining paper on Greek immigrants in Canada because <laughs> I knew that there wasn't a lot out there. So I went and uh, saw him to talk to him about this. And he said to me, Chris, I think that you would be wise to choose another topic. Now, he didn't try to deter me because he had something against uh, Greek people or something like that. but. He said to me, there, you're going to have a hard time finding resources. And I wanted to do it anyways. And so I went against his advice. Well, when I went to the library, I found a lot of resources that were stereotypical, uh, mainly related to their food, dancing, uh, lingering for long periods of time in cafes, screaming about politics. And then there was some sociological accounts that talked about Greeks uh, from a socio sociological perspective. So, you know, the uh, extent to which Greeks worked in certain labor markets, the extent to which they finished post-secondary school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this was not an accurate reflection of what I had heard from my parents and my family members growing up. So. I heard nothing about, or I saw very little about uh, women's experience there. I saw very little about, uh, frankly, the very difficult situation and, and culture that Greek immigrants encountered when they came to Toronto, in particular uh, outside of Toronto. So a lot of Greeks settled uh, out on the outskirts of Toronto and it was uh, outside of the Greek Canadian institutions that allowed them to operate in some familiarity with respect to culture and language. And I saw nothing of that in, in these documents. And I was in one of North America's largest libraries at the time. And so I really thought that this was a problem. This is a problem that the Greek Canadian History Project is working to solve, along with the Claire Thomas archives. You know, there's a more complete understanding of the Greek immigrant experience. And I think that we are just scratching the surface. In many ways, my experience sort of mirrors uh, Chris's in that uh, when I did my undergrad, part of what led me to where I am today 
is that a fourth year Canadian history course encouraged me to write about my community. Um, a lot of it was just pretty much about uh, the movements of clergy. A lot of it was about uh, key individuals that left their mark on the community. And, but it encouraged me to do my master's. And in my master's, I accidentally found a mislabeled file at Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa that had significant information, correspondences and pamphlets, um, relating to uh, the Coptic community's use of St. Matthias Church uh, by Trinity Bellwoods Park here in Toronto. And to this day, I think whoever it is, this unnamed person that took the initiative to pack up this file and give it to Library and Archives Canada. Michael, if I may just interject there. So this is the very infrastructure that... Uh, as I mentioned before, journalists, but also filmmakers and people who inform our collective consciousness and our, and our collective, yeah, novelists as well. Th these people inform our collective idea of who we are and where we have come from. And they do so in very profound, but also very different ways. So the, the archive is the foundation of all of that. The Coptic community is a great example of what I mentioned earlier about the a cohort or a generation that came uh, in the 60s. It's very much part of the um, opening of, of uh, Canadian immigration to non-European uh, immigrants uh, after the point system is introduced. This is a time where, of budding multi multiculturalism and so they're very much uh, part of a wave of new Canadians that forever changed Canada and, and Toronto. And Unfortunately, there's a number of institutions whose records are, are gone forever because they were in a basement, the basement got flooded, which happens all the time in the city, and that's it. Such a rich history is gone. One of the approaches that's been quite distinct about the Portuguese project, the Greek project, and now the Kant project, is that it's really um, the projects themselves that are deciding what will be kept. Well, you know, through your own research, through connections within the community, you're finding the documents and you're making the decisions. And traditionally, particularly within academic archives, within public archives at the federal, provincial, or municipal level, it's the archivist who makes that decision. But I'm certainly not qualified to decide what the voice of the Portuguese or the Greek or the Copt communities should be. It should be the communities that decide what their voice is. And it's really through these projects that you get the opportunity, as Jill mentioned, you know, to, to reach out to individual members and allow them to participate in the way that that community is understood. And I think that that really separates these projects from a, a lot of other initiatives. And I think it makes for a much, makes for a much richer tapestry. Um, the reason that, that we're involved in this, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, from the library's point of view, is to support research and teaching at the university. And it's really because graduate students at York were involved in these initiatives that we developed these partnerships. If those documents stay in private hands, then nobody else can benefit from access to those perspectives. Nobody can challenge your conclusions. Nobody can build upon your work. And by bringing them into an archives like the Clara Thomas Archives, everybody gets a chance to share them. So it's not just graduate students or undergraduates at York that come and make use of our materials. Anybody, any member of the public can come and visit York University and use the archives. It is open to all to develop that broader understanding of a very diverse uh, network of communities. How can members of the community benefit? Well, I think that there's been several examples of how members can, can benefit. I think, for instance, Chris, of your work, um, when the exhibit was installed in the coffee shop. So you take historical photographs and you actually put them in a public place where they become a center for conversation and reflection. Um, they can be used, um, just thinking of archives in, in general, we've had filmmakers such as someone working on a documentary of rock and roll on Young Street. And so they come in and they use the photographs from the Toronto Telegram of the various clubs 
and the musicians playing at those clubs, you know, like in Tina Turner and, and, and people like that. And it just sort of creates this consciousness that Toronto really was a different place back in the 1950s and in the 1960s. And so I think that increasingly we're seeing a mobilization of information and archives to create um, knowledge in a variety of, of frameworks, whether they be exhibits or whether they be film or whether they be podcasts or whether they be books or articles, um, articles in scholarly journals, but also in magazines. It just, it helps to form this, this broader consciousness about what those communities were doing. Um, one, of the, one of the statistics that I think I was uh, quite struck by when, um, when Gilles' project was starting up, one of the goals was to be able to share this information across the diaspora. And so when we, after certain uh, collections were digitized and put up on York's website, um, we were able to track the use statistics. And after Canada and the United States, the greatest number of visits came from Portugal. And it really, I think, connected with one of the objectives that Gilles and his colleagues had set out for the project, and that was to take a body of information and to be able to share it so that it's not just local to Toronto, but it's international in scope. So wherever the Portuguese have gone, people can look at these sources and get, under, get an understanding of what the experiences have been like across the diaspora. Uh, on our Facebook page, we've looked at where people are viewing the short snippets of history that we're uh, writing about certain photographs or about events that we're doing. And it's coming from all places in the world, including India, various countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's been really exciting to see. So this history is getting shared across the globe. The other thing that I've noticed, and I think that this became particularly relevant for uh, Greeks abroad, so Greeks outside of Greece recently, is that I think the history, it gets... It's very much informed by our contemporary context, and I saw changing perceptions of Greece in the past 10 years, and I think that having the archive and to use that against you know, the manipulation of, of, of identities or of history, I think that that's an important uh, thing here. And if without the archive, it's simply impossible because then you just get into, well, this is what I heard, that's what I heard, and without an archive and an official document, then it just becomes, I guess, people yelling at each other. Yeah, I mean, this is what us historians call evidence. This is the evidence that we need in order to write the stuff that we write. And while certainly I would love to think that lots of people would end up reading the articles that, that we publish in the, you know, academic journals, or the, the monograph that hopefully will be published at some point, the reality is that it, 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 they won't. There won't be a, a, a lot of people doing so. Um, so that's why uh, all of our projects uh, invest also the other side of the, the democratization um, aspect, which is the public history side of it. We've done uh, photo exhibitions, online exhibitions, walking tours, digital walking tours. Uh, we've been doing TV for the past uh, two years. Uh, using in many of the episodes uh, materials that we've collected and have been deposited uh, at the at uh, Clara Thomas archives, but also students coming through York, not just York, but you know they're arriving at York and they find out that these collections are here, uh, and then suddenly they they get to write about the things that they care uh, to write those papers like you did when. Uh, try to write and, and did write in your undergrads um, about the Portuguese uh, community. And so it's a really interesting time because, like I said, you were both having the first generation, the first cohort retiring, but you have a new cohort, second and third generation, sort of uh, uh, coming through the ranks of uh, Canadian universities and uh, seeker higher education. 
um, and trying to do what uh, sociologists often say, you know, what the, what the child wishes to forget, the grandchild wishes to remember. Um, it certainly is the case uh, with the Portuguese uh, community where you're seeing third, even, even fourth generation uh, Portuguese Canadians wanting to find out what happened, why am I here, and why is my family the way it is. This year alone I've had uh, two students uh, who are Coptic uh, approach me that, and say that they are interested in writing about the Coptic community here in, in Toronto or in Canada in general. And before, as I mentioned, when I was doing my undergrad and doing my masters, I had to hunt and try to figure out how I'm going to find material to write about this. Now, these young members of the Coptic community, or various Coptic communities, can come up to me, tell me, I want to write about the history of my parents or my grandparents, and I can show them documents that they can view and write these histories. I can direct them to uh, materials that we have donated to special collections at the Claire Thomas Archives, and they can access it from campus, where they go every day and learn about their history and learn about their community. So definitely beyond benefiting uh, the individuals who donate and in benefiting the institution, it benefits the young generation that's curious and wants something to connect them to their past. Michael, if I may just say, uh, it's not just insiders of the communities that are doing research. Uh, last year, a grade six student from uh, the Toronto School Board contacted me and through her mother and uh, her mother asked me how they could do research for a project on an immigrant community in Toronto and the little girl had chosen to do the Greek immigrants in Toronto. She had no connection to the culture whatsoever and she ended up coming to the archives and spending a day here and learning from the various photographs. There is the element of language acquisition, sometimes with some of the documents of course, but through the photographs, that limitation uh, is really gone. So uh, anybody can come and use the, the uh, acquisitions and, uh, you know, they can fill their curiosity that way. What advice do you have for listeners who have records at home and are not yet convinced of the value of donating them to an archive? I think one of my, my first bits of advice would be that this material is um, inherently transitory or unstable, if you like. Newspapers deteriorate with age. Um, video tapes that you might have in your basement will develop a condition where they become unplayable. Um, the basket of photographs that you might have tucked away in the top of your hall closet, you'll suddenly discover at some point that nobody will remember who's in those images. Um, the photographs or, or, or the letters that you might have tucked away in a, in a cabinet somewhere might get thrown out when it comes time to move quickly. And that You may think that this material will last forever, but it does require effort to ensure that it's properly preserved. And that, getting back to a point that was made earlier within the discussion about people's stories, that quite often it's the individual perspective that can make people connect with the larger story and to never underestimate uh, the value of their own contribution, their own lives, and um, that even though they may part with it physically, you know, particularly through digitization and through copying, we can make um, surrogates of those records available to people for more members of your family to become engaged with the records as opposed to lose contact with them. Uh, just because you may not have them in your hands doesn't mean that people can't see them. Just because they may be at York doesn't mean that you, you can't come and visit them. We're always happy to have researchers visit us, whether it's the general public, whether it's students, whether it's scholars from other countries. Um, these records are preserved so that they will be used, and that new knowledge will, will be built, and that we really do promote our understanding of the human experience. Don't uh, uh, think uh, either that 
by dig digitizing uh, your, say, photo, uh, family photo album that you are ensuring is preservation, uh, you know, in, in perpetuity. Certainly, it's, uh, it's a good step in the right direction. Do not throw away the originals. So to that person who's uh, perhaps considering whether they should donate something and they are listening to this podcast, I would just like to say that you've taken the time to preserve something, obviously because you feel that it's important. And you may be contemplating whether you're going to donate it somewhere or just perhaps throw it out because maybe a lot of people around you don't see the value in the work that you've done and in the items that you've preserved. But historians and archivists do find this stuff to be very valuable. And at the same time, uh, we respect the process and the work that has gone into it and the documents themselves. So we're here to chat and it's something that's important and obviously you have a, an appreciation for that. So uh, let's chat and open up a conversation.